Hi everybody, Shelly here. Today I'm going to show you how I painted this portrait using the Selective Start method. With Selective Start, you pick a feature to begin your portrait with. I've selected the nose, which is a little unusual for me. Normally, I start with an eye, but I'm mixing it up today and starting with the nose. Before I began painting my portrait, I went ahead and mixed up my palette. Here you can see the palette and I've got the initial colors going across the top. And I like to arrange my palette so that I have my darks at the top and then in the middle you'll see the mid values and then just below there we have my lighter values. I'm painting on a 12 inch by 12 inch canvas board which has been oil primed. I have then gridded it into quarters. I just divided it in half and then into a quarter and then into a third. And with the grid down, I can use my trusty proportion tool, which you see here, with one-to-one -one measurements. So everything that I measure on my computer screen monitor to the left of the canvas, you see it here, um, is going to be exactly the same size as what I am painting onto the canvas in my portrait. So I've also gridded my reference image on the computer exactly the same way, just divided in half, quarters and then three quarters horizontally and vertically. So with Selective Start, you don't necessarily have to use a grid. Sometimes I don't use a grid at all. I just like to kind of eye it and uh, paint in a way that uses comparative measuring. So for instance, I may take her right eye and compare the different features and where they fall on the face as compared to where that right eye is lying. And in Selective Start, the grid is helpful. It's just kind of like an armature. It just keeps you in check and it gives you more points to measure from, but feel free to paint your portrait without a grid. The other cool thing that I love about Selective Start is it's perfect for impatient people like me who just want to jump right into the meat and potatoes of it all you know going in with color and you know correct placement and and full detail right at the beginning i know most painters especially the ones teaching new artists to paint portraits <laughs> say you know avoid detail in the beginning you know maybe don't worry about matching color in the beginning but in selective start that's the whole point so if you're new to painting portraits and you want to try Selective Start, it's a lot of fun. I suggest you give it a go. Just, you know, be kind to yourself and go slow. Be patient. You know, put down a brush stroke or two and then think about it. Decide, you know, are those couple, two, three brush strokes in a good place? Are they the right color? And if not, then correct those two to three brush strokes. And that way you're managing small bits of this selective start process, it's more of a bite-sized, manageable approach to it all. So there's some other ways to maybe assist the selective start portrait painting. You could go ahead and do this with one color and make it a monochrome underpainting. Now some underpaintings, when they're finished, if they're painted with a lot of detail, like you would be doing if it were a selective start, uh, it's going to be its own beautiful work of art. You may not want to add, you know, the full flesh tone colors on top of it. But once it's dry, you can. You can go right over the top of your monochrome underpainting and do the selective start method where you're just focusing now on matching the colors to the values that you already created in your underpainting. So you're really just focusing on matching the values and getting the color correct. So you've kind of taken away the idea that you need to work on your drawing and your composition, which that would have been handled already in the underpainting process. Okay, so you've started your selective start portrait. You've completed the first feature, the one that you chose to start the portrait with. And, it, and in this example, it's the nose. So I've pretty much painted the nose to a full completion. Now that's not to say that once I get in some of the other features and get closer to having a full portrait, that I won't go back and kind of fine tune any of the features that I painted 
before that point. And you can see here that I went ahead and put in a little bit of that background because this eye on the left is really kind of on top of the background. So I wanted to put that in so that you could see a little bit of it coming through where I put in those eyelashes, especially the lower eyelashes because they're quite pale or light uh, compared to the upper lashes. And it's good to get sort of that airy feeling by letting a little bit of that background have a play in it. I'm using the vertical grid line to see where exactly this eyebrow on the right is going to start. And now I'm using the horizontal grid line to see just about how far down that I need to bring it. You can also see that I'm using a pretty light value um, color initially. Uh, that way, if I need to change the position of that eyebrow, it'll be more easy to do it. So I chose this photograph. It's from a free site called pexels.com. I'll leave a link in the description. So if you wanna try to paint this portrait as well, you can get the reference there and then get to work on your painting. And if you do it, I'd love to see it. Make sure you send it to me in an email, which is also in the description. So with that being said, why I chose this photograph is it, I feel like the lighting situation was really unique. She's got this beautiful bright light on the you know front side of her face and then this really cool bluish shadowy light color kind of coming in in the back of her neck and I just wanted to play around with being able to capture and and mix those paint colors like that purple in the back of the neck that seemed a little bit challenging for me because you always hear you know you're going to be painting cool lights warm shadows and then I know purple can read as warm or cool depending on what colors are surrounding it so I just felt like the lighting situation in this portrait was going to bring some unique challenges and I wanted to play around with it so I don't know if you guys know, when you're painting photographs, there's a couple of things that you have to be aware of. And the first thing is, most of the time, the lights are being shown in the photograph as too light. So usually when I'm working from a photograph, I tend to dial down the brightness of the light areas. And then the other thing that happens with photographs is the shadows are usually portrayed too dark. So you wanna lighten the shadows up and then <laughs> darken down the lights a little bit. And usually that'll give you more of a um, realistic situation, whereas if you were viewing this person in real life. The other reason I chose this photograph, besides the really great lighting that was happening, was the fact that it had a hand in it and some really cool jewelry. So I love the challenge of painting hands and the added bonus for me of putting jewelry into the portrait as well. So the next thing I wanted to mention was when you're painting features, especially things like the nose or the hand, it's a really good idea to forget about what you're painting. Don't think of it as a nose. Don't think of it as a hand. It's just puzzle pieces of color. And these colors have specific values. So if you can nail down each shape and its correct value, when you stand back and look at it, you're gonna see that nose or that hand. Okay, here's another thing I see happening with a lot of uh, photographic portraits. The eyes, the white of the eyes are usually painted too light of a value. So if you're working from a photograph, maybe check you know and think about darkening the white of the eye but only to the degree that makes sense for the painting remember you're the master of your painting the photograph is not the master you be in charge okay the other reason that i chose this photograph is i wanted to work on my transitions for the side of a face like here you see there's a lot of cheek and jaw and neck and those transitions can be tricky so I thought by practicing them here 
that it would help me to get better at making those transitions in these types of areas. And if you're new to portrait painting and you're not quite sure what I mean by transitions, what I'm talking about is moving from one light area of the face towards a darker, more uh, shadowed area. And you don't want to do that by just blending the light color into the shadow color. That's just going to give you a muddied mess. What you need to do is walk towards the either the lighter or the darker direction. You could start in the shadow area and walk towards the light, or you could start in the light and walk towards the shadow. But the important thing is that you're creating new colors for each step, and the color needs to make sense. So for instance, if you're stepping out of the shadow, moving towards the light, each step's gonna get a little lighter in value, but it's also gonna change in temperature. So you're in the shadow, which here are pretty warm, you know, hot shadows. So we're not only going to get lighter in value as we walk towards the light, we're also going to get a little bit cooler in temperature. You can say a lot about the 3D form by just using temperature changes. Now I practiced this ideal when I did um, some master portraits by um, Van Dyke. So those are in my library. You can go and look those. One was, uh, I believe, Isabella Brandt. And then there was another one, Cornelius was another master copy. And each of those uses just temperature changes really to you know, get down the form, the 3D form of the face in the portrait there's not really a lot of value changes. It's just temperature changes, which can work just as well. As I'm moving down the face towards the chin, I'm paying attention to the fact that the light is falling away and these areas are getting a little bit darker in value and a little bit warmer in temperature. So just pay attention in your portrait work to where the light is coming in at and realize that further you move away from the light source, if there's only one light source, things are going to change in that way. They're going to get darker and a little bit warmer if you're following the light, cool lights and warm darks kind of scenario. So if you want to see me paint the hand in a bit more real-time situation, I did record it live, so it's in my um, video library. Uh, you can find that there and you'll see how really slow <laughs> and meticulous I lay down my brush strokes, especially when I am working in Selective Start. The whole painting of this portrait probably took me about, I'd say, six hours. And I really didn't do too much fine tuning. A lot of times when I finish the complete portrait, I'll look at it, step back, stare at it a little while, walk away, have a sandwich, a glass of wine maybe, <laughs> come back, and then look at it and see things that I want to adjust or fine tune. With this one, I really didn't see much. So. Um, I actually had someone pose the question to me the other day, how do you know when your portrait's finished? Well, I, to me, if I can look at the portrait and really not find anything else that I could possibly do to make it better or read more towards the final result that I was going for, then it's done. So you can ask yourself, if you're not sure, you can ask, okay, what, what do I like? What's working in this portrait? And then you can ask yourself, well, is there anything I don't like? Maybe what's not working in this portrait? And so if you're really not having to answer, uh, you know, there's nothing popping up when you're saying those things to yourself, then I think you're pretty much done. Now, what happens after you've been painting for a while and you have paintings that are hanging around and maybe they're on your wall and you've been staring at them for a few years now and you've grown as an artist your skills have improved your the way that you look at artwork has changed a little bit 
then <laughs> you can ask yourself those questions again and you may have different answers. I know I have taken a painting off the wall, sanded the face off, and then repainted it. And this was probably, I don't know, like five or six years from the finished painting to when I sanded off the face. And it's with these kind of practice portraits that you really want to be bold. You want to experiment. You don't be afraid of making an unusual brush mark or trying something that you've not tried before. And if you wanted to, you could finish the portrait, let it dry, and then with it being dry to the touch, you could go over it with whatever kind of unusual technique or brush stroke that you want, or maybe an unusual color mark, color note. And if you don't like it, then you can just simply wipe it off so there's not anything, you know, you didn't change the portrait in a way that was detrimental or not fixable. It just, it's because the painting was dry, you're able to just wipe away that experimental um, mark or color. So I guess the whole point of that rant was <laughs> have fun with your portraits, especially these you know type of portraits where it's just practice for yourself. It's not a commission or something where you're under a lot of pressure to get it right, and uh, you know have time constraints on you. Just play and really push yourself um, technically, or you know with different brush strokes and color usages. This is the time to play. You can see here I'm using the tip of my palette knife to put in some of these wispy little tiny hairs that are glistening in the light. And if you want to get a little bit thicker hair kind of mark, you can use the back end of a paintbrush. Another thing to think about when doing a selective start portrait is you can use a white canvas as I did here, but you also could use a toned canvas. So that's something to think about as well. So this jewelry looks like it's got maybe some rhinestones and it's pretty much silver based. So what I like to do is put down say a mid value gray initially for the jewelry, get the shape of the jewelry, and then go back in with either the highlights or the dark notes so you can work back and forth you know put a few highlights in you could put a few dark notes in but you've established with that mid value gray initially the shape of the jewelry now remember that the jewelry is not flat it's going to have a little bit of a shadow coming down on the right side of it so we want to make sure that we get that in and also thinking about how the light's hitting that jewelry on that index finger, the left side of the ring is going to have the brightest highlights while the more um, right side, which is turning away from the light, is gonna start to get a little bit darker. So it's gonna have more of those black to dark gray notes in it. So I'll just mention again that as I'm painting this hand, I'm not thinking about the fact that I'm painting a hand. I've completely put that out of my mind. I am looking for the little tile shapes. Maybe some are a little bit larger than others, some are very small, but I'm looking for those shapes and I'm trying to figure out what color and what value that shape is and where do I need to put it down. And that's all I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking, is this a knuckle? Is this a finger? No. Also, you can see here, I'm using my most favorite comber brush. So that actually has the little hairs that are kind of shaped like a comb. There's a bit of space in between and it kind of overlaps with the brush stroke that you laid down previously and they kind of blend together a little more seamlessly, I feel like, than say if you're using a flat or maybe a filbert. It's like each brush strokes woven together on its own just because of the way that the hairs are situated in this brush. I'm really liking the way that the blue backgrounds play nicely off of her warm oranges colored skin. Now that's happening because on the color wheel uh, blue is the complement to orange. So that I believe is why this background works so well here. 
And here's something I'm using the fan brush for. I like to give little flicks to certain areas of my portrait. With this instance, I felt like it would work really well with the hand in this jewelry. I wanted it to give the idea that the hand just landed here with her finger to her mouth. And I wanted to give it a little bit of that motion blur, which I did with the fan brush. But I don't leave it all blurry. I like to go back now and put in more detail. I love using a fan brush for this kind of effect. I've done it uh, with hair. I've actually done it with the mouth where I wanted it to look as if the portrait subject had just been speaking. So if you are, you know, just miserly, I guess is a good word, with the fan brush, and then, you know, you can leave the marks if you like them, but if not, after you use the fan brush, you can always go back over and tighten it up again. So again, that's the whole point of these type of experimental practice portraits. This is when you need to go nuts, and I like to go nuts with the fan brush. <laughs> so can you guys see in the reference picture of the hand how the fingers towards the tips of the fingers are kind of in shadow. The light's not hitting them. They're bent slightly away. They're actually being backlit and that's why you're getting a little bit of a orangey glow on the edges of the finger. That's the backlit situation happening. So you want to be mindful if you're painting this portrait that you keep that area of the hand in a little darker value. Now the fingers from the knuckles to the knuckles on the hand portion are going to be just a slight bit lighter. They're still having a bit of shadow and a bit of light hitting them, but they're not as bright as you can see how the back of her hand and the back of that index finger appears. So always be thinking about where your light is coming from in your portrait and how it's affecting the feature or the item that you're actually painting. Here's a look at the finished portrait. So there's the close-up of the hand and then I'm gonna pull out here. You can see my messy paint palette. It's created all kinds of awesome new colors and there you see the finished results. I appreciate you guys so much for watching and I hope to see you in the next one.